Uh, by the way, um, I'm, I'm Nick Campbell from Grayscale Gorilla. This is Chris Schmidt from Grayscale Gorilla. And Hi, today, uh, we are going to replicate something that we do on the site every once in a while. If you're not familiar with Grayscale Gorilla, we make training tools and tutorials for motion designers and for Cinema 4D. And uh, we always get questions, right? There's so many, uh, so much technical uh, knowledge and, and artistic knowledge out there. And our goal with Grayscale Gorilla is sharing as much as we can, as as much as we learn, it's about sharing it out into the world. And so, we started this what four years ago now, I think. Yeah. Uh, and we would show up online, and li live streaming was becoming a bigger thing. And we decided to just hop online and answer questions, and we called it Ask GSG. So bring your Cinema 4D questions, and we're going to do our best to, you know, either show you what we know about it, or you could literally watch us learn about it as as you ask a question. So I, th I figured we'll kind of replicate that today and uh, oh, we get a little behind the scenes here. Boom. So before we get into that, uh, and so get your questions ready is the main one. So we're going to reach out to you guys. If anybody has a question about a specific module or part of Cinema 4D that you're always like, I always see it, but how does that thing work? Uh, we're looking for questions, uh, especially if you have something specific you're trying to accomplish. Um, and so we're, we're going to tackle it. Uh, that's the goal. So it's kind of flying by the seat of our pants here. Yep. But well, we've been doing it for four years, so uh, hopefully we can try to figure this thing out. So real quick, I just want to show you what some of our customers have been doing over the last few years. We make uh, you know, training and tools, and we're always uh, surprised and amazed to see all the awesome work that our, our customers make. So real quickly, I just wanted to show you some of that from over the last couple years. So just a little peek into what our customer's been up to. We're always excited. And if you have something you're extra proud of and you use our tools, please hit us up. We're always looking for new stuff. So really quickly, if you want to pull your phone out, we have some downloads. We have free stuff on our site. We've been slowly uh, collecting free th things to give out to our uh, customers and, uh, and, and our students, anybody learning. Uh, so we have a plenty of resources here if you want to check that out. And I'm going to sh show this slide at the end as well. And then if you want to learn more about Ask GSG or want to watch other episodes of Ask GSG, you can learn more about it at gracecodegorilla.com slash askgsg. All right, enough talking. Let's get into some questions. I know Chris is ready. Uh, we also have some questions from uh, some of our friends online. I just want to say hi to you as well. and Thank you for participating and doing that. So that's for later. And so um, let's start with the audience. Does anybody have a, um, uh, has anybody seen Ask GSG before, first of all, in the audience? Awesome. Yeah. All right, cool. So you get you kind of know what we're what we're up to and you know what questions we can kind of tackle in the time that we have. So you know, like how to make Lord of the Rings is never a good question, right? That's uh, that takes a little bit longer. But anybody have bit. a question? We can start to start to uh, play with or answer, even if it takes thirty seconds. We're ready. Yeah. Oh man, he's asking uh, back when the motors and connectors and all that stuff first came out, uh, and the aerodynamics. Uh, I went and I put together an actual kind of working helicopter in Cinema 4D. I have not done that in a while, so let's see if we can do a little something along those lines. That's uh, my favorite. When, when Chris says, I haven't done this in a while, but let's see, I know I'm gonna, about to learn something. So, uh, Okay, so we're going to start out. We're just going to jump into Cinema. We got a cube. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste the cube, and we're going to make a skinny one. Not that skinny. And let's make a little bit longer. And we want to actually make a propeller blade here. So we're going to put that into a group, null. I'm going to hit Alt-G. That's going to automatically drop that into a null. Let's grab this one. I'm going to pull it off to the side. I'm holding it on Shift, so it's automatically snapping. Let's do about 250 there. Let's make an opposite. Actually, we'll grab that one, hit R for rotate, and we'll spin this one, I don't know, 20 degrees. And we'll 
grab a, an op equal opposite one here. I'm going to go to positive 250, and we will rotate that one to negative 20 degrees. So the most basic possible propeller blade setup on here. So um, let's go ahead and turn this into like a, a compound shape, I think. So I'm going to throw that into a connect object right there. It's going to collapse it down as if it's one object. So here's our base, and here's our propeller. So I'm going to right click on that, and let's go ahead and go to simulation rigid body. So those are both dynamic. Now if we hit play, they'll fall out of the scene. Now we need to connect them. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to simulation dynamics and let's make a connector. This connector should be able to be moved up to about the right position here. And you can see it's the in, it's not the right orientation. So R for rotate. Let's hold down shift so it snaps. I'm going to go exactly to negative 90 degrees. And we need to connect between these two. I always like putting my connectors visually between the two objects I'm connecting, just as like a visual reminder of what it's doing. So I want to connect between the propeller up there to our object down here. So those are now dynamically connected to each other. And now we need to make a motor. Actually, you know, I'm also going to make a floor, just so we have something to land on right there so it doesn't fall away. And why don't we go ahead and use the new viewport option, the SSAO, so we can actually see a little bit of contact point down there. So now let's do the motor and see if we can get this thing working. So uh, motor, the motor is going to behave very similarly to our connector. So let's go ahead and put that in the right spot. Let's make sure it's in the same correct orientation. You can see the little arrows are spinning around. And let's make it do the same connections that our connector had. So now those are connected between two of these. Now, this is actually going to be spinning simultaneously the, the top one one direction and the bottom one the other direction, which we can avoid, but I'm not going to change that yet. Um, so this is just going to give power to this connection. So by default right now, hopefully what's going to happen is it's going to fall on the ground. We're going to see a little bit of rotation going. Or we have to put a dynamic tag on the floor, and then we'll see a drop to the floor. And we can now see the two things are counter-rotating. The friction on the bottom stopping it from moving after a second, but it is now spinning. It's spinning the wrong direction. Um, so let's go ahead and increase our timeline length. I'm going to jump up to 999 because it's type, it is quick to type. And let's go ahead and grab our motor. And we're going to give it a angular target speed of, let's say, a negative 1,000. So you have two different numbers here that you're working with when you've got a motor and you're dealing with torque, rotational torque. You have your speed that you're trying to get to and the torque, which is like the power of that motor, how much power is being fed in. So does it take a long time to spin up there, or is it going to get a lot of power and like really be fighting for that? So if we go ahead and we type in a torque of 100, then we got 10 times the power there. We can go ahead and play. And right away, we're, you see, we're getting crazy spin. Um, and you can see that the bottom, uh, the bottom object is being treated as lighter here, at least it seems to be. Um, so I think we can tell this to apply only to A. So now the rotational is only, the only, the rotation is only applying up to the propellers, the connect object. So if I play, the cube isn't being affected at all, and that is now spinning. It's going to go faster and faster and faster. I don't know how fast it's going to be too fast, so let's just leave that there. But this is a really good start. Now we can jump into our connect object, which is our propellers, and let's go ahead and play around with our... Uh, aerodynamics. So we have drag and we have lift. I think we are mostly just concerned with lift right now. Because these are cubes, I don't have to worry about two-sided. If they're planes, you'd want to turn two-sided on. But I'm just going to go ahead and type in 100 on our lift and see what happens. Okay, so as you see it's moving a lot more slowly now. I think the lift is starting to fight. So let's go ahead and start cranking our motor up even more. So let's go ahead and do 10 times the strength again. Why does the... Well, there it goes. Well, there we go. <laughs> Why does the lift do that? Is it, is it kind of like it's adding oxygen to the scene and it's kind of slowing everything down? It, what, what, what made it slow down right there with the lift? I, yeah, I think so. I don't know. We might have to ask, ask uh, Burn exactly what that's oh, doing uh, afterwards. Oh, it's so nice. But uh, I, my assumption was always it was kind of calculating the angle of a polygon and the surface area, and that would automatically kind of, kind of give it a direction to push. So with these two spinning... Uh, it's going a little fast. Let's go ahead and zoom out and hit play. And that just from the spinning, it is now lifting it with the arrow. Oh, there it goes. I didn't say it was stable. I said it was lifting. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the motor seemed to go a little crazy there. That's not surprising. We could do things to counter that. It might be a good idea to put the connectors in with the object. That might be bad as well. But that kind of stuff is fun. And what's really cool is that these are all super, like, I mean, it's all dynamic, but... You could go ahead and grab these. I'm going to put them both into a null. We could make a cloner. You knew I was going to ask this, oh, right? Yeah. I, sorry, I jumped ahead. That's really my only question at the end of most things Chris does. I'm like, can we put it in a cloner? And now we have 50 of them. So let's go ahead and make a couple of them, spread them out a little bit. Uh, those will be colliding, so let's give them a little more room. And just for fun, why don't we go ahead and grab a random effector. 
give them a little bit of initial offset, uh, offset on their spin. And why not turn on color just for fun? So uh, let's go ahead and hit play. And they're all individually going. And right, let's see. This half of the audience is red. That half of the audience is green. First one's to crash. Nope. No, they're <laughs> green. Nope. Yellow's going strong, though. Yeah, so yeah, I think that, uh, that kind of covers that one. We got uh, the aerodynamics. You can, you can go and get really advanced. At one point uh, at Half Res, an event that we run in Chicago, I did an airplane simulator with Espresso where you could just drag a slider and it would like, actually change the flaps on a plane and actually go and fly around. We had a whole simulation that we built from scratch on that. It was really fun. Yeah, that was awesome. Nice work. Bravo. Well, this is working. Hey, hey, thanks for a good question. That's fun. Anybody else? Question? Well, we have a question from uh, online. Yes, we do. Chris, do you have a... What was the name again? Well, I'm going to find it. Uh, I think it was Ben. Ben did a great job. We asked for questions, and he was asking about making some chameleon skin. So kind of this chameleon skin looking effect. And I thought these all looked really cool. So we just got all these patterns. We just jumped into Google image search. So just the way these all lay out and they look all crazy and funky and colored. We're not gonna get that specific, but this reminded me of a technique that I bumped into recently that I think we can get something decently similar and it would be kind of fun and dynamic and you'll be able to make it look super pretty. Oh, it's Jeff. Sorry, we gotta give Jeff credit. Um, so thanks so much for putting the work in Thank and you, Jeff. Uh, prepping that up. So we want to make a rig here, and Nick is going to be able to go ahead and make this look nice and pretty. So this is kind of roughly our reference. I'm not going to go overboard trying to aim exactly for that. Uh, but let's go ahead. I'm going to start out by we're going to make this dynamically, which is a really fun part. So it also turns into a potential motion graphics piece. So um, to make it kind of scale like, why don't we go ahead and uh, sphere cube, uh, hard to decide, but we'll do a, we'll do a sphere. We'll probably make a whole bunch of them. So we're going to go pretty low poly on our sphere to start out with. We can crank up the polys a little bit later. Let's go ahead and make a cloner. We're going to go ahead and drop a sphere into the cloner. Let's go ahead and turn it into a grid. We're just going to work on a flat plane here, but if we want to wrap it around a creature, there's probably a bunch of ways we could do it with attractors and or just deforming it around a surface. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab our sphere, hit T for scale, scale it down until they're not quite touching. Cool. And now that we've got that, something that's neat is we can change our mode from end point to per step. And now as I increase our count, it's automatically going to keep that even separation as it goes. So now we've got a big old grid of these. Not, we didn't go overboard, still running nice and fast. So let's go ahead and I'm going to create a floor because we're going to be working with dynamics. Middle mouse button click so I can see the side view. I'm going to move the floor right below the sphere. So they can fall a little bit, but they're not going to be intersecting it. So let's go ahead and add our dynamic tag. I'm going to grab the floor and the sphere, right click, simulation, rigid body. So we should be able to hit play right now. And you saw there's a little bit of movement. Uh, let's also give ourselves some more frames, 999. Doop, doop, oop, misclick. Okay, and okay, so what is the plan here? Let me show you the basic effect. So we're, gonna go, we're going to add a MoGraph plane effector. Plane effector is so good, so simple. It does everything. So uniform scale, and we just want these to scale up. So that gets pretty big. We might even go bigger than that. Um, so that's a nice uniform version of this. Uh, now, if we hit play right now, they're going to explode. They're going to shoot off in all directions because they're intersecting already. So what we want to do is kind of fade up into this. So I'm going to go ahead and make a spherical fall off. So now we've got a tiny little spherical fall off. I even like it having not a maximum fall off here. So we can leave in the 50, you know, 50% uh, range there. Scale it down to zero, and we can right-click, record there. Let's fast forward to, I don't know, about 200 frames. And I'm going to grab the scale and scale that up until it's big enough to completely capture the entire collection that we've got there. So that's going to happen over the course of 200 frames. Let's see what happens right now. So we hit play. Oop, they still exploded. Maybe I didn't run. OK, I just didn't rewind all the way. So now you see that they are scaling up as it goes. And what's really cool is the outer ones are being pushed away. But they're rolling away like way too quickly. So what we're going to do is tell them I don't want them to roll away so much. I want them to just kind of push each other apart. So why don't we go ahead and go to the dynamics tag there. And I'm going to go to linear dampening. And we want to suck all the energy out of here. Not all of it, just most of it. So we're going to do 99.99. Uh, so what this should do is just drain out all of the positional energy as it's getting pushed away. If we wanted not to get a lot of rotation, we could do the exact same thing on the angular dampening. So we're just pulling all that energy out. It's not like they can't be pushed away, but they're not going to keep the momentum going. So now when I hit play, they're going to start getting pushed out. And you see they're not shooting out in the rest of the direction. 
So already, like, I really love the way the growth looks over there. Um, now, uh, one small problem that we're getting is they're kind of jumping up on top of each other a little bit, not too much. Because we're working on a flat plane, we have a couple different options. Um, the, the super duper quick one I'm going to do is let's just go to our global dynamic settings. I'm going to hit Command D, and we'll go to dynamics, and uh, we've got gravity. So I'm just going to make gravity 10 times as strong. So now gravity is really pushing the ground, so hopefully they won't be climbing up on top of each other as much. And let's see what we get now. So yeah, much better. And now they're getting pushed away. And we're getting this really nice, fun, organic layout here where they're no longer, you know, they're not colliding, but they're also not overlapping each other. So you get a lot more of that really fun, organic, offset look. Um, now, right now, that's all pretty uniform. So instead of just doing this with a plane effector, we could do something like... Are you uh, thinking what I'm thinking? I don't know. Let's, let's see. I'll, 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 <laughs> I got a uh, mental note here. Oh, you're going to go random. I'm actually going to go shader effector. Dang it. I lost that one. You were, you were thinking random, weren't you? I was thinking. OK, so we're going to grab a shader effector. And pretty much, we're going to do the exact, same, the exact same thing. But what's cool about the shader effector is we have a lot more control over what we're feeding it. So I'm going to say that I don't want to control the color, uh, but I do want to control the overall scale here. So we can even say a big old offset here. And let's go into our shading. And let's just drop in something like a noise. And I'm going to make the noise, uh, let's make it pretty big. I'm going to actually jump right up to, let's say, 2,000. Um, yeah, 2000 is OK. We're, I kind of want to see a little bit of the pattern here. It's a little hard to tell when we're just looking at scale. We could push it further if we wanted to. And we actually might be able to see it better. If we go to the Effector tab, go to Min Max, you'll see it's actually going anywhere from 0 to 100, which means it can go from its original scale to bigger. But I'm going to say, you know what? You can go from your original scale to smaller. And now you can see the, the pattern emerging a little bit more. We get patches of small, patches of big. So that's kind of a cool additional combination there. So why don't we go ahead and treat this the exact same way we are the plane effector. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the plane effector. Let's, actually, we'll go to the shader effector. And let's change this to a spherical fall off about 50%. And I'm just going to quickly steal the animation from this one by right-clicking on the animation and going uh, copy track, going to this one, and right-clicking and saying animation, paste track. So those should be doing identical movements now. It should now be growing up, but now there should be variation in between them. So now you see we get big ones and we get small ones to fill out the pattern. So the last thing I want to do is set up uh, set this up for Nick is get some color variation, and then Nick will be able to choose whatever colors he wants to. So before, I, I don't know if actually we need to do it in this order, because we did not practice this at all. But uh, I'm going to use another shader effector. Uh, and you've, you see, I've got my cloner selected, so it automatically applies it. So what this one is going to do is just I want to apply color on this one. So let's turn off the alpha strength, and I'm going to on this one, we could do a noise, we could do a gradient. I'm not sure. What, how would you like to control it? Like a gradient passing through all of them? It might be kind of fun for stripes. I'm talking to him yeah. like, like, <laughs> like there's not an audience here. Here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, the color coming from the center, kind of like growing okay. out with it, like it's all plain and, and black and white or something. And then all of a sudden, as the action is growing, so is the color. OK, and we can, make a color, we can make a color ring there as well. So the way we'll do that is I just apply a gradient. So we get this shader. In fact, we got two different shader ones. So it's good to, I'm going to name this one shader color. So we know we're controlling the color with that one. So let's go ahead and we're driving the color. Let's go ahead and change this to a circular gradient. So now this should go from the middle out. Uh, it's a little hard to tell there, but it should be doing that. In fact, I think we're not getting the full contrast unless we go turn on our strength. Or maybe not. Or maybe we have to change the color to black. I'm not sure. Let's, oh, the pro OK, actually, this is interesting. You see that the projection, I think, is happening from the side. So you see it's a kind of a stripe traveling through the middle. Also, I want to make sure that this is calculating first. So the shader color will be the very first thing that happens. Let's see, make sure color is not affected there. Cool. And this is shader color. We can, yeah, that's using alpha. That's using the shader. Maybe the projection. It, would be, it might be a good idea to, do, to steal the projection from something else. So what I'm going to do, actually, is make a material. And we'll just put the color into, let's just say, the luminance channel of a new material. And I'm going to go ahead and drop in the gradient there. Let's make that circular again. And now we can take this and apply it. I don't actually know if it works on the floor, so let's find out. I'm going to put it on the floor. We're going to set that to a flat projection. Cool. And we can already see a tiling, but now I can grab that, hit T for scale, scale this up till we're kind of our overall pattern. Now that's on the floor, but we can go ahead to our shader, and I'm going to tell it not to be a custom shader, but to look at the luminance channel of this shader. So that's taking on the projection mapping of that shader. So uh, we don't even need to, well, I don't even want to see the floor. So we're going to hide the floor, but still taking on that gradient. So that is now applying the overall color to it. 
And uh, now that that's happening, we can make a quick shader on here. I think this will work. Uh, we'll drop this on the actual clones, and this is where Nick will be able to control the color. I'm going to go into the color channel and make a, a MoGraph color shader. And this color shader should be referencing the color channel. So whatever we're feeding through is what you get here. But what this means is you'll be able to take this color shader and throw it into a colorizer and make whatever gradient you want coming from the center out. Now, you said you wanted the color to travel outward like the rest of them were? That's, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking here's the, here's the uh, like emotional arc of this animation here. You got a bunch of plane spheres. The, maybe it's like for a OLED TV kind of thing. And you're like, this is old technology. This is what you've been looking at your entire life, right? These boring pixels. But with our TV, right? It explodes with color and different scale and all this crazy stuff. And that's how you sell TVs. So that's kind of the, that's the vibe I'm feeling on this. What do you think? I like it. And the way we're going to do that is just create a spherical fall off on this one and pretty much do the exact same thing. I've still got my track copied, so I'm going to right click, animation, paste track. And now the coloring of them should also travel straight along it. So they're going to start out as black. And as this uh, scales up, hopefully we're going to see the colors travel through. Although it's looking, oh, OK, now it took a little while to get to the uh, colored ones. But they are indeed going. And once you change your gradient, you'll have complete control over those. I got you. So that gradient will just will, will control all that. Yes. And right. if the fall-off was in the correct order, yeah, I mean, if we change the order of operations, it might change the way those are mapped out, but I think that's working pretty well. I'm feeling this. All right. So if you, if you haven't seen Astro Studio, this happens a lot where um, Chris always ha has more technical ability to like, put all these MoGraph things together, and he is so good at like, thinking about how these things come together. And then it's often where he's like, all right, this is looking decent. I'm going to hand it off to Nick, and he's going to texture it, light it, maybe add a camera, and start to set up how this scene feels more than how, what it does. Right? A, a very important thing to, thing to do before you pass off to someone else is save it. Like, I'm even wearing the shirt. Save often. Yeah, especially, save everybody. <laughs> especially when you hand it to me, because the first thing I'll do is throw this in another cloner and try to make 8 million of these dang things. Fancy TV one. <laughs> Fancy TV. All right, do you want to switch maybe yeah, sure. headset here, and then we'll, uh, I could jump in. Uh, here, trade. Oh, right. Wow, this is, this works. OK, so as everybody, I, I talked, I, I was, as I'm watching this and seeing it explode, I kind of like, what kind of commercial is this like reminding me of? Oh, I need to whack them. You guys say whack them, you say whack them. Is anybody here to confirm how do you say that? Whack them? That's what I'm thinking. All right. Well, you would think it was Wacom, but the company themselves say, says Wacom. If there was only a place where I can meet the people that make this. Oh, wait, we're here. All right, so here's, as Chris is hitting the, hit, hitting the play here, I'm like, all right, this feels really organic. It feels like, you know, it's, it's not necessarily like perfect chameleon skin, but th the often like the metaphors from how we figure this stuff out comes from nature, comes from, you know, a lot of, a lot of inspiration. So as soon as I saw this animation, I'm thinking, well, this looks like almost like it would look really cool macro, depth of field, really close up. And you're like, what, what's this boring thing? And then it kind of explodes with like rainbow color and, and like all these spheres and, and, and like unique things. So it's almost like, you know, like 1984 Apple commercial. Everything's gray and everything's black and white. And then, you know, the woman comes in with, the, with like pink rainbow top and like swings the, th uh, swings the hammer and like it, things explode into color. Like it has that kind of like, like boring for here. And then colorful. So let's let's ex explore that. Um, and what's nice about Cinema 4D is is it allows you to think in this way and not have to always plan out every detail ahead of time. It allows you to think creatively and say what if and be able to work and, and work through that idea very quickly. And it also allows you to do it procedurally. So we don't have to bake all this down. We could just try a different gradient and see how that works. So you're saying it's in here. It's in the colorizer. And then this is essentially our, our, our thing. So um, I'm going to come in here. I think I have to twirl this down. Load preset. Now, this is my favorite right here. No, here it is. Ha ha, ha. Almost, almost got confused. OK, so, so it's nice. Here's the best part about um, they're like my favorite part about my job is I get to do this. Hey, Chris, what's going on? <laughs> Why is this broken? Uh, uh, so uh, the gradient here, it, it's just not uh, pushing. Is it just that it's not open all the way? It hasn't gotten out of a blue yet. I don't think, or the fall off might be Oh, different. I see. Now, what we need to probably see. do is jump into our original gradient and maybe pinch the black down a little bit more. 
Okay. So you grab, grab our uh, midpoint and start scooting it back. There oh, you go. Oh, baby. This, I oh, mean, I want to animate We, we could that. also can, we could, uh, put a keyframe on that, too. So. Okay, so that looks pretty good. So, so now we're talking. So now we have, and then what I would do is I would uh, just make this the black color. So I grab that gradient, and again, we're, what's nice is I just get to experiment with this. I'll let this go. Um, and so maybe what we'll start with is something that's, that's black here. And then that should, yeah, there it is. So now it's starting black. And then I even want to cheat it and just push right to this pink because I'm loving that color. And so it starts kind of warm in the middle. Hey, hey, Nick, right click in the middle of any other gradient and say distribute nuts. This is how I learn, folks. <laughs> this is how we all learn. Thank you, Chris. OK, so boom, there it is. Now, we may have to tweak something to get those like last little black pieces out of the way. Maybe we have to pinch that knot in or try to fake it somehow. But I love that look. Like It's super you know, explosion of color style. So if you didn't see my presentation uh, yesterday, I talked about the viewport and how you could start to see your look inside of the viewport without necessarily having to hit render. Or if you've seen my old wor older workflow, where I, I put up a um, a uh, interactive render region. So I want to show you, it's a little bit of overlap from yesterday, but I think this scene is perfect for it. So the first thing, we have our textures. Uh, we're going to add um, some reflection in our textures here. Uh, this is our colorizer. That's the one colorizing it. That should be fine. Reflectance, good. So right now it just has this default specular. And um, this is kind of old school like texture, right? The specular is made to, uh, or at least old school, like the way that this is made, it's made to make uh, reflections render fast. And now, you know, we have much faster computers, and man, specular is just kind of off my radar these days, especially in the physical render. So instead, we're going to use the reflectance channels. And if you've used the reflectance channels in physical, um, they're really powerful. You can layer them all up. And we use them so much that we uh, made a plugin called Top Coat that allows us to do this really quickly. So I'm just going to use that really fast because this is what we're doing. We do, we do tutorials, we do them fast. So in, in, in Top Coat, you can layer up your reflectance. And so really quickly, I'm just going to add uh, a gloss layer. And then I'm going to shift click to add a lacquer layer. And that's going to add all, this, all these reflections instantly to that material. And uh, I won't get too far into that. But I'm going to dial down our uh, reflection just a bit. And so that'll at least give us some, something to reflect as we start to add uh, some HDRI. Feel free to uh, crank up the poly count on the spheres now we've got the uh, scene. I know, I know you want those to look nice and shiny. You, you know me so well, Chris. Is 20 too much? Oh, oh no, good. it's not, baby. Um, I love my life. Like, I, I, love, I love spheres. Did I, did I ever tell you that? All right, so. <laughs> I didn't even think about that when we were starting this one. We we're going to do a shiny sphere tutorial. I, I really appreciate it, by the way. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a camera. And um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to zoom in. Something I've been talking a lot about lately is picking the right lens for your camera. So if you're thinking about this as if it was a real thing, like the chameleon skin uh, concept, what you're going to think about when you pick your camera is what, what lens would you pick to make this look more realistic? Well, in the real world, we're going to have this little chameleon. How, how big are chameleons? They're, this big? They're real. The little? <laughs> I don't get out much, guys. All right, so they're, li they're, they're this big, even better. So what do we have to do to film this close on textures for a chameleon? We got to get like a zoom, zoom, zoomed in camera, right? Microscope almost, right? So like we're going to pull out this big lens and get way down in there and get in. We're going to get in this chameleon's business. And to do that, we have to choose the right camera. And so think about that when you're making these decisions because it will show and give you the feeling when, you, when it comes to render, when it comes to the tone of the scene. So I could even crank it more. And the more that I crank this, the more flat and the more microscopic this will look, right? I'm going to show a quick demo here. Um, like this is super flat and it's super you know, angled and it's, it's like this beautiful flat pattern. And now let's contrast that. If I use the default camera without messing with this, it's, it's 32, uh, I think it is, no, 36. So 36. So instantly, OK, now we're zoomed back. It's still linear, but that's not our scene. We want to look close. OK, so now we're somewhat close. But again, we have more perspective in this scene. And I'm just going to click this other camera. And you can see it flatten out. Now, that may look subtle to you, but as we start to get things uh, animating and, and close to the camera, it will look drastically different when we use a more flattened out camera than when we use zoomed in. If you want to learn more about that, just uh, type camera, uh, like what lens to pick in Cinema 4D, and we have a whole tutorial about that. Uh, I'm going to delete that one. I love this look. We're going to get microscopic on this. 
And it's going to grow kind of organically from the corner. And we're going to kind of get this nice rainbow look going. And so I like that style. So let's, um, uh, let's add some depth of field. Let's get the scene set up. And let's also add some HDRI so we could try different reflections in this scene. Also save it again. Oh my gosh, save it again. Uh, all right, so uh, I, won't, I won't go over too much uh, of some of these viewport settings. I went over this yesterday, literally yesterday in my, in my uh, presentation. Um, so if you're watching this later, go watch that, and uh, it'll make a little bit more sense. We're going to add some screen space, um, ambient occlusion, and some depth of field in our camera. And uh, I'm just going to go to our viewport settings and turn that stuff uh, up as well. So this is just going to add a little bit of detail in between each sphere. And then the biggest one that will be a little bit more obvious to everybody is uh, depth of field. So boom, blurry. Um, I won't go over it again. It's on, on yesterday's presentation, but I'm really impressed by the quality of the depth of field just in the viewport. You get some really beautiful looks, and you could kind of look dev uh, depth of field really, really easily. So I'm going to go into object. I'm going to select uh, focus distance and pick what is in focus. In this case, I'll just start with the black spheres here. And then we, we might have to get a little bit more on an angle to start to see this depth of field. It's also that we're very, very far away and that these objects are very, very large. Now, um, we're, we could do a couple things. We could shrink our objects, right? Or we can just kind of cheat the camera. At this, what I would do if I had more time is shrink the objects and get it more to the scale that I want. But because we're doing a, a quicker demo, I'm just going to cheat the physical camera instead and just keep dropping this number down until it is what I want. Okay, so now we're talking. Okay, so this is going to give us a um, very, very narrow depth of field. I'm going to choose my focus point again. In fact, it's so narrow, we may have to dial it back up. Um, okay, there it is. So, no, uh, 08. I'm thinking 08. Okay, so now we have, now we have, uh, oh, I see, it's, it's too, it's growing too much. Okay, so we got, we have to repick our camera, or maybe it we animates We also make a out. bigger field. That's true, we could also make a bigger field. So that's actually a good way to talk about that. We can, we can just add more particles to this scene, um, and we may have to grow our gradient and change a couple things there, but this is why I love Cinema 4D. It allows us to just say, we need more particles. We don't have to rethink this whole scene. We could just start adding more objects. And because the dynamics work so well, I know Chris is cringing. I'm like clicking that arrow instead of typing it in. There, boom. There we go. It's like, don't crash it. All right. So now it's literally like so many more objects. Now, obviously, the dynamics will be slower. We just like, what, quadrupled the amount of like spheres here. But now we can experiment and see what does this look like and how does this feel. So this is like a cool concept, right? This, is, this has like some nice dynamics. We've got some growing happening we got, here. Oh, we got we to crank our gravity more. There's so many more spheres that they're jumping up into the air now. Oh, see? We okay. need a thousand times gravity. We're, we're, thousand. Going, we're going to interstellar here. All right, so uh, Command D. Command D will get you into your dynamic settings, and you're saying you're at we're, another zero. We're at another zero, baby. Going to the moon. All right, let's see. I'm going to hit play and see if they just start pushing down. Oh, sure I do. see them do. Oh, get down. Okay, so a rough concept, but this is something we could start to kind of show our team or show, you know, a client say like, hey, this is kind of where we are. Like we're, you know, a half an hour into something like this or less. And we just prototype like an entire um, like, like idea that's like, hey, maybe we go pitch this to our creative director or we go pitch this to our client and say, this is kind of the idea. These are the old boring pixels in your TV. This is old school. This is plasma BS, right? Now we're in OLED land. Uh, you know, you have this new, um, you have this new uh, uh, TV out. You're going to sp speak better than this in front of the client. And then, you know, you have this new TV out and it's going to explode with color and it's going to have all this like rainbow, blah, blah, blah. And you show them this. And obviously, you don't show them this. Uh, you show them a, a quick hardware render, which I'll do, uh, again, just based on yesterday. Um, you know what? We'll just do this. Again, uh, I'll, I go into more detail about this on my presentation yesterday. Uh, it's hardware OpenGL. I'm going to turn on enhanced OpenGL, our depth of field, our uh, reflections, uh, the screen space AO. I think that's all we need there. And then I'm going to use a, a script that uh, Chris actually and his, uh, his uh, uh, development team developed just for this, which will remove some of these little objects from our screen so, we could, um, so that we could render it a little bit cleaner. Filter switch, I'm just going to turn that on. And uh, let's go back into our settings, make sure it is set to all. I'm not going to do all frames. I'm going to say manual, zero frames to about 300 was where this ended. And uh, we're not going to save it. We're going to render this out. 
and see where this is going. Zoomed in, man, look at that. Okay, so now the hardware uh, renderer is kicking out a rough version of this. And so what's really nice about the, uh, the hardware OpenGL, or the hardware OpenGL renderer is it could sit there in the background, uh, I'll, not quite in the background. And then we can also go in and make changes. So one last thing I wanted to do uh, was talk about lighting. Lighting and texturing are uh, what I obsess over in Cinema 4D. And I want to show you another plugin we made called HDRI Studio Rig. And if you do a lot of lighting, if you use physical render, definitely check it out. It's one of our most popular plugins. And it's because lighting is in every scene you do. And uh, for me, at least, I never know exactly what lighting I want. I, I love the idea of just experimenting and playing with it. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to open up our HDRI browser, which is included. And you have access to different packs that we sell of HDRIs. In this case, I'm going to grab one of my favorites, which is Church Entrance. You get this nice um, kind of reflecting area here. Now, I'm not sure if the uh, rotation will quite work, so we're, we might have to angle our camera instead. That'll be a, another day, another demo for you guys. And I'm actually, Church Entrance let me down once, and it's on a live tutorial, Chris. This, this um, HDR is like my go-to, and it's always beautiful. But something about the way that those spheres are kind of interacting, maybe it's because of our uh, microscopic idea. Maybe it has to be a little, bit more gen or, uh, a little bit more abstract. So that's making me think something more like Pro Studio's Metal, which gives us these nice, weird shapes to play with. So let's click around and see what we can find. In fact, these are a little bit too studio-y for this. I'm going to try one more. And this is Road Trip. we got some weird ones. This actually has an interesting feel. Ooh, this is kind of gross, too. I'm looking for one that's kind of gross. You know what I mean? Because this has like a little bit of a slimy feel to it. OK, so what's nice is we just tweaked around, played around with all this, and now we can go back and do another render. Uh, so we have to zoom in here. We may have to reset our uh, focus distance. Let's go ahead and do that. Details, object, focus distance. Bam. And then if we want to test this out, so let's go back to our uh, render picture viewer. And see what we got. So here's where we were. And uh, oh, good. I get to show you uh, the RAM stuff. So a couple things down here, we're not seeing um, all of our frames in real time. But this is actually OK, because the animation itself is kind of done by a around here, about 137. So let's, uh, let's just shrink this down, shrink the playback down. And then if we go back, you're going to want to make sure all frames is turned on. Uh, and then it's going to basically RAM cache this entire animation. Again, I talked about this yesterday. Oh, we're losing frames here. It, it'll cut off at the end. I think. Yeah, we'll, we'll cut it off. Uh, that'll be another demo for another day. But let's, uh, let's RAM cache this out a little bit further and see kind of where we end up. And so, of course, this is just the hardware OpenGL render. Um, this is not our final render. We'll have to go into physical and, and, and set all that stuff up. But to me, this workflow, again, that I talked about yesterday, allows us to get this level of like concept in a short amount of time, right? We took like a photo from Google Images. Chris worked on MoGraph and set up our textures. We worked a little bit with you know, our cameras and our lighting and a little bit with our textures. And we got this that we can now show a client. Uh, and then if there's tweaks, we know that we can make a tweak and render it and show them back again. So that's, um, I th I'll, I'll, call it, I'll call it a success. What, what, would you, what would we change if we had another hour on this scene file? Uh, what would one, you do? One thing right away I think would be really cool to do with this is now that the dynamics, we could cache the, the, the dynamics if we wanted to, but something cool would be grabbing all of these and scaling them like to a tenth of their height so they're a lot more flat. Mm. And maybe even like taking the floor and pulling it up 50% of the distance so they would turn more into like droplet shapes, which might feel a little bit more like the scales. Oh, I see. So it's intersecting a little bit with like a, an object yeah, and instead be flatter, of just spheres. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Um, I, would, I would tweak the lighting more. I'd, I'd like to see it in physical render. I'd do like a low res version in physical to see how the shadows interacted. It's, um, with the hardware OpenGL, it's very fast. And you get some really basic idea of what this feels like. But to me, it's, you, you're missing those contacts. And that's really, to me, where it's going to look really microscopic, the way things interact at a micro scale. This feels a little bit like it's not micro enough to me. So I try to gross it out a little bit more. I try to find um, a more like organic looking um, uh, HDR and maybe even add a little bit more like blurriness and scratches and stuff like that. Ooh, you know what would oh. be cool too is uh, if we did have the floor up a little bit and you had some luminance in there, the luminance could be casting light on the ground. So it's like it could be really dark. The 
crappy TV. And then as it blows up into your fancy brand new TV, it's illuminating everything. Oh, see, this is good. We got to pitch this to the client. I did want to show you uh, really quickly Gorilla Cam, uh, mostly because th this is a perfect demo of it. Um, it's a new plugin, and uh, we it allows you to take your existing camera and just really easily, uh, won't go into any more detail than this one button down here, which I've been loving, called I'm Feeling Lucky. And all it does is uh, add some variation to your animation. And so right away, we're going to uh, scale this animation down a little bit. But now um, we're going to just see what that looks like and just hit hardware render while we a answer any more questions. So we have um, maybe just a couple more minutes. Uh, we can't dive into another big project like that. But um, if anybody has like a 30 second to one minute question. Oh, cool question. So the question is like the original um, Google image uh, had its sh own shader. Is there a way that we could use those colors like directly and put it into that scene? Like use that image to, uh, to say like as it grows, use that color palette? There, there's some really cool ways of like bringing an image in the Cinema 4D. Uh, and I'm trying to think if there's anything more dynamic that you could do. But I'm just saying you'd bring in the image or even just like scoot uh, this off the side, move cinema, and just you'd grab your color picker on the gradient and just be like, I want that one and that one and that one and that one. That would be the quickest, quickest way of getting these colors. Yeah, but is there a way to actually use the image? Like if, it, if you wanted a logo on it or something? Like, I guess we have that tutorial. We where, do have that tutorial. Yeah, all right. That's really easy when you have 500 tutorials on your website. You just say, like, we have that tutorial. Simpsons did it. But so, even, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, if you look for it, it, there's a one where we project our logo onto a bunch of clones like this, and it'll have a similar kind of uh, like workflow. But then that makes me think of a completely different rig. That's another way of doing it. But then we could take that photo, do something like put that in cinema, uh, look at it from the top view, grab the polygon pen, and just start tracing out all of the different little cells. And then we can start doing different effects on top of that, like use the... Uh, uh, what do you call it, the poly effects, and then start like extruding those out individually, and you'd actually be using the photo as the reference, and you would have manually modeled all of those out. I can't think of any way of like magically matching that geometry, but if you spend a little time and draw that out, I think you could, could match it pretty dang well. Oh, I see what, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, cool. A uh, couple more minutes. I don't want to run over, but I love answering questions. Cinema 4D questions? Haircut questions? Anything? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, good question. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, what's the difference? I, so earlier I was like, I think you're going to add a random effector. And Chris instead used the shader effector. Can you talk about why you picked that and, yes. and not the other one? Well, there's, there's a bunch of different reasons to go ahead and, uh, and pick the different ones. Like random is really great. And there's even a couple different modes where you can get larger noises. But if you use the random effector, you can really quickly get randomness all over uh, each kind of individually doing their own thing. But I want there to be a little bit more of a pattern to them overall. So I grabbed the shader effector, and I could very precisely use any of the, the procedural noises in Cinema 4D and use exactly that pattern, scale it up to any size that I want very easily. I could see it in the viewport. And then you saw that it wasn't working exactly the way I wanted to, and I ended up taking it out and reprojecting it flat. And we could have done that also with the shader. So we could actually project it down onto the plane or the floor, see a perfect preview of what that's going to do, and then have that be applied to the clones. But I use a random effector all the time, but the shader effector just gives you that patterned randomness. Yeah, if, I, if I'm doing a demo, I'm trying to show off how MoGraph works very quickly, I'll always grab random. It's a beautiful effector. And if you're doing basic randomness, it's awesome. If you want to get more detailed and really have control over how things move, I, then you, get, you have to get into shader. And they're both, they're both super easy to use. Just one takes a couple extra steps. Um, any last? Yeah. Uh, ooh, good ooh, question. Good question. Let's find out. Uh, I can actually answer it right now as he does it. Question, but question is the technique. Well, yeah, I think the scale, the scaling would work, but the can color. Can you repeat won't. the question yeah. real quick? Oh yeah. Uh, would this technique work if we turned on render instances? And render instances in, in <clears throat> excuse me, render instances in Cinema makes it so that all the calculations are going to happen way faster. It's not like recreating the geometry every time. It's just making a, an instance of that geometry. But uh, the colors that we're piping through won't translate if you turn on render instances. But I think all the rest of the animation would. OK, so let's see what we got here. Um, boom, render instances is now on. I'm going to hit play. Good, good. So yeah, there you go. Dynamics work, scale works, everything works, but the shader, uh, as, as I understand it, like. It basically treats every object as the same object. It's like render instances. It's just instancing the object. So anything you want to do separately to each object that's not scale or position or rotation, it just doesn't work. 
Oh, I run into this all the time. I like turn it on by default. Oh, like yeah. Like at render instances. That trips us up all the time. Yeah, and then we're in the middle of a tutorial or, or, or like trying to figure something out, like why doesn't this work? And that's it. So uh, honestly, like half the time, leave it on. It'll render really fast. And then if you start messing with textures, you got to turn it off. Yeah. Yes. Uh, is, the question is, any, is there any reason to use the software renderer? So this is actually um, maybe a question to ask like while they're developers and stuff here. Uh, so I, as far as I understand it, um, and you're asking about this, right, software. So there's, there's software OpenGL and hardware OpenGL. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be correct here, and then if I'm wrong, I'm hoping this gr crew will like raise their hand and like throw me off the stage. Um, hardware OpenGL uses your graphics card to render, and then software OpenGL will use your computer chips. <laughs> CPU, that's what they call it. <laughs> those, those, those technical guys, they get all into those acronyms, you know, the CPU. Yeah, so uh, to me, it's like if you have a machine built with a lot of CPU, try that and use the faster one. I think they look pretty similar to me. Yeah. Uh, anything else? I actually else? didn't know that. Yeah, there you go. That's cool. I think you're asking about like third party renderers like, and like when to use them, right? Maybe? Yeah, so, so what I would look at is ProRender, right? So they're, they're making some strides with like building, building in a GPU render. So the question is like, what, what's with all these you know, third party renders? I've been using physical render a lot uh, in this new workflow flow with hardware OpenGL. Um, and of course, there's so many new renders out. Um, so one way I like to think about it is see what, see what you could do with the internal stuff. And then, and, and Maxon's also doing the same thing. They built in ProRender to start to experiment with GPU and OpenGL kind of stuff that's built in. So I would experiment with that. They're always working on it, making it better, and then just see what's right for you. For me, I've been, like, I, I've been experimenting too, but I always love having a built-in render that's beautiful. And I think physical is amazing. And this hardware OpenGL system that I was talking about yesterday, working with those two together, I think is, is, is uh, at least right now where I am. But I'm always looking yeah. for new stuff. So and, yeah, if you want more information on renderers and all the way that stuff goes, just make sure you jump over to Grayscale Gorilla because Chad is constantly covering all the stuff, and we cover all the rendering news on our podcast. So yeah, we talk about renderers all the time over there. Awesome. Well, uh, I, w I just want to say as we we're getting close to the end of the show too, Maxon always puts on an amazing show. I just want to thank them one more time. If you guys give it up for Maxon for having us all here, bringing all these artists out. And again, um, let me pull up a slide. Uh, just so, because I, I promise here, if you want to learn more about Ask GSG, uh, Chris does this. Sometimes I'm on the show, sometimes Chad's on the show um, about doing this. We do this once a week. So head to grayscalegorilla.com slash askgsg and then figure out when we're going live. You could show up in our, uh, uh, usually it's on Twitch, on right? On Twitch, yeah. You could ask these questions live and, you know, uh, watch, watch Chris do more of it. Uh, we're also, let's save this scene file, um, which I can't forget to do. And uh, we'll just share this out as well. So if you want to sign up, we have a ton of free downloads. Anything that you pick on that page, completely free. You could download it today or tomorrow. And then as soon as we get back from NAB, we're going to be sending anybody that uh, downloaded anything, that scene file, and also stuff from my presentation and, and Chris's yeah, as well. A bunch of stuff from mine, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, um, thank you. Thank you so much again. And uh, really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Thanks. Mm -hmm.